On April 12, 2025, a Mitsubishi MU-2B40 carrying six people vanished from radar near Kopake, New York, and crashed into a muddy field, leaving no survivors. A few weeks ago, we had an early analysis of the crash, exploring the initial data and flight profile. If you missed that video, the link is in the description below. You can check it out for a fuller picture. Now, the NTSB has released a significant update to its preliminary report, revealing new information that brings us one step closer to understanding what really happened in those final moments. Let's break down those findings and what they might mean. The aircraft at the center of this accident was a Mitsubishi MU-2B-40 Solitaire, a high-speed, twin-engine turboprop known for its compact airframe and demanding flight characteristics. Registered under tail number November 635 Tango Alpha, the aircraft was manufactured in 1985, bearing serial number 458SA, and was operated at the time by Dynamic Spine Solutions, LLC. Previously, the aircraft had cycled through multiple registrations, including time abroad as XBFQM, a common trait among older corporate-operated airframes. On board was a tight-knit group of six individuals, most of them members of the Groff family, for whom this was a special occasion. At the controls was Dr. Michael Groff, a renowned neurosurgeon and aviation enthusiast who held a private pilot certificate with instrument privileges. Accompanying him was his wife, Dr. Joy Saney, a pelvic surgeon, and their two children, Karenna Groff, a standout NYU medical student and former NCAA soccer star, and Jared Groff. Rounding out the group were Karenna's partner, James Santoro, an investment banker, and Alexia Coyutas Duarte, Jared's girlfriend. The group was en route to celebrate a 25th birthday and Passover Seder, a personal, meaningful journey that would tragically never be completed. The flight began at Westchester County Airport on the morning of April 12, 2025, with Columbia County Airport in Hudson, NY, as its intended destination, a relatively short hop to the north. Takeoff occurred at 11.34 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and the aircraft quickly climbed to a cruise altitude of 16,000 feet MSL, consistent with a typical IFR profile for the MU-2 on this route. At 11.48 a.m., the aircraft was cleared to descend to 6,000 feet, likely in anticipation of the approach to Columbia County Airport. However, things took a turn shortly before noon. At 11.57 a.m., Dr. Groff informed ATC that he was initiating a missed approach, a maneuver that suggested either weather below minimums or difficulty establishing visual contact with the runway. The aircraft then re-entered a holding or maneuvering pattern in the vicinity of Philmont and Hillsdale, New York, looping in a complex path as it remained in IMC. The final ADSB data point was captured at 12.02 p.m., with the aircraft descending through 2,150 feet MSL at a ground speed of 118 knots, moments before it vanished from radar. Less than a minute later, the aircraft would crash in a wooded area near Kopaki, a quiet town nestled near the New York-Massachusetts border. What began as a weekend flight with family would become a case study in spatial disorientation, aircraft complexity, and the dangers of high workload flight environments in marginal weather. At approximately 12.03 p.m., just over 30 minutes after departure, the Mitsubishi Mu-2B-40 exited the clouds in a steep, irreversible dive over Kopake, New York. Captured by a nearby security camera, the aircraft emerged nose down from the cloud layer, a chilling visual confirmation of the final seconds of flight. It was a moment of sudden, violent descent, one that left no chance for correction. The aircraft's last recorded orientation showed it heading on a magnetic bearing of 290 degrees, roughly 500 feet north of the final ADSB position. This bearing is notable. It doesn't point toward the airport, nor toward any logical transition fix in the approach sequence. Instead, it suggests a rapid, uncontrolled deviation from the cleared path, potentially indicative of spatial disorientation or an attempted recovery that never stabilized. The impact site was a snow-covered, muddy field, and the terrain around it made access for first responders extremely difficult. The wreckage was compact, with debris strewn across a 150-foot radius, consistent with a near-vertical, high-energy impact. That pattern often suggests that the aircraft remained largely intact during descent. It didn't break up in flight, which aligns with video evidence showing both engines audibly running until the final moment. Tragically, all six occupants perished on impact, 
No distress call had been made. No last-second maneuver attempted to arrest the descent. In that way, the MU-2's final moments mirrored a number of other high-performance GA accidents in IMC, sudden, silent, and final. The rescue efforts that followed were hampered by the site's remote location and muddy terrain, but by the time responders arrived, there was little doubt. The aircraft was destroyed, and the scene offered no immediate signs of survivability. What's particularly sobering here is not just the outcome, but the sequence that led to it. A missed approach is a demanding maneuver under the best circumstances, but when layered with poor visibility, single pilot workload, and a highly responsive aircraft like the MU-2, the margin for error becomes razor thin. The transition from controlled flight to an unrecoverable dive took mere seconds, and those seconds, tragically, are all that mattered. While the final report remains months away, the NTSB's preliminary findings offer just enough information to sketch out a sobering early picture of what may have gone wrong in the skies over Kopeik. The flight was conducted under instrument flight rules in conditions that were, by all measures, demanding. At the time of the accident, an overcast ceiling lingered just 400 feet above ground level at the destination airport, far below visual minimums. Airmets warned of instrument conditions, mountain obscuration, low-level wind shear, and moderate icing from 1,500 to 17,000 feet, an altitude band that encompassed most of the MU-2s en route and approach segments. Despite no convective sigmets in the area, the environment was anything but benign. The aircraft's final moments, captured by security footage, revealed a steep nose-down descent from the cloud layer, an image that speaks volumes. Engine noise in the video confirmed both power plants were running at the time, suggesting there was no sudden mechanical failure or in-flight breakup. Instead, the trajectory hints at a more insidious threat, a total loss of spatial orientation. In instrument meteorological conditions, without any visual horizon, even experienced pilots can find themselves trapped in a sensory illusion. That illusion can turn a momentary deviation into a catastrophic loss of control, and in the MU-2, a notoriously responsive airframe, such errors can become unrecoverable in seconds. The timeline of radio communications further adds to the mystery. At 11.57 a.m., Dr. Groff reported initiating a missed approach, standard procedure when weather prevents a safe landing. The aircraft then climbed briefly and leveled off, but instead of returning to a published missed approach path or re-establishing on course, it entered a descending right turn. That maneuver was inconsistent with the cleared IFR procedure, and within minutes, ATC re-cleared the aircraft for another RNAV approach, instructing descent to 4,000 feet. But just moments later, the controller issued a low-altitude alert, an urgent warning that the aircraft was descending too low. There was no response. Radio silence at such a critical moment is deeply unsettling and may imply that the pilot was already overloaded, disoriented, or no longer in full control of the aircraft. There is also the question of ice. The MU-2 was flying squarely within the altitudes affected by the icing airmet, and while there is no direct evidence of airframe ice at this stage, it cannot be dismissed. Even small accumulations can destabilize flight characteristics, increase stall speeds, and interfere with control authority, especially dangerous during low-speed maneuvering in a descent. If the aircraft's anti-icing systems were not engaged or were insufficient for the conditions, the effects could have compounded the difficulty of recovering from a disoriented flight state. Finally, one cannot overlook the aircraft itself. The MU-2, for all its speed and range, is not a forgiving platform when flown improperly or under high cognitive load. Despite significant safety gains following FAA training mandates, the aircraft still demands sharp attention to systems management, particularly during single-pilot IFR operations. In this case, Dr. Groff was flying alone, managing not only a complex turboprop, but also navigating a missed approach, fluctuating weather conditions, and potential system interactions with the autopilot. All of this unfolded within a matter of minutes. The human brain, no matter how experienced, has its limits. What we're left with, then, is a scenario that reflects an all-too-familiar pattern in GA loss-of-control accidents, an unforgiving mix of adverse weather, complex aircraft behavior, and a single pilot pushed beyond the manageable edge of workload. The specifics are still coming into focus, but the broad strokes already carry weight and raise difficult, necessary questions about the systems, conditions, and decisions 
that led to such a catastrophic loss of life. While the preliminary report lays the groundwork, several key questions remain unresolved, and they're central to understanding how a routine short flight ended in catastrophe. The foremost concern is pilot proficiency. Dr. Groff was a licensed and experienced aviator, but flying a complex turboprop like the MU-2 in IMC demands more than basic currency. Was he adequately trained and current specifically for single pilot IFR operations in this aircraft? That distinction could be critical. The aircraft's condition and systems also demand scrutiny. Was there any anomaly in the autopilot, flight controls, or trim that may have contributed to the descending turn? The MU-2's automation can be a helpful tool, but if misunderstood or misconfigured during a high stress phase, it can quickly become a hazard. Icing remains a strong suspect, given the active airmets and flight altitude. The MU-2 is equipped with de-icing and anti-icing systems, but it's unclear whether they were activated or functioning properly. Even a thin layer of ice can degrade control authority and increase stall risk, especially during low-speed maneuvering after a missed approach. There's also the troubling lack of radio response in the final minute. Did pilot incapacitation play a role, or was the pilot overwhelmed by workload and disorientation? Without voice recordings or physiological evidence, the distinction may be difficult to determine. Other operational factors, such as weight and balance, recency of training, and possible autopilot mismanagement, could have played a supporting role. Each of these areas will likely be explored further in the full NTSB investigation. Until then, this case stands as a complex intersection of aircraft capability, environmental stressors, and human factors. The definitive cause remains out of reach for now, but the questions being asked already point to a scenario where multiple small margins may have eroded all at once. That's all for today's video. Please share your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe for more updates.